Hello, and welcome to Zion Lutheran Church in Hollidaysburg, Pennsylvania, as we celebrate the fifth Sunday of Easter. Thank you for joining us. Uh, a few announcements just before we begin. First, next week is uh, our baccalaureate here in the Hollidaysburg Area School District. Uh, so on Sunday, May 22nd at 7 p.m., we'll be gathering at the Hollidaysburg Area High School Auditorium uh, to uh, bless our graduating seniors. So once again, baccalaureate this year on May 22nd at 7 p.m. That is next Sunday night. Also, uh, on Friday, May 20th, here at the church, we are having our Art, Arts in Recovery event. That is an event that uh, celebrates people in the process of recovery through, uh, through the arts, through music, through uh, uh, different types of mediums, painting, uh, poetry, all sorts of things. That is happening here on Friday night at 7 p.m. And then uh, just one thing, keep us in prayer today. We will have our annual meeting here uh, as we uh, talk about the upcoming year for us. Our fiscal year starts July 1, uh, but we're going to you know, talk about our upcoming year, also the upcoming capital campaign. So that's happening tomorrow or today if you're watching this. Uh, I'm recording this on Saturday night. Uh, it will be happening uh, on Sunday. Uh, at 10:45, and then we are having our capital campaign kickoff. So keep us in prayer as a congregation as we begin that journey. So those are the announcements I have for you. And now let us begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, let us be reconciled to God and to one another. I invite you uh, to reflect uh, for yourself uh, for the times where you need reconciliation in your life. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. Uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins, through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O Lord God, you teach us that without love our actions gain nothing. Pour into our hearts your most excellent gift of love, that made alive by your Spirit we may know your goodness and peace through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our reading today is from the book of Revelation, the 21st chapter. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who is seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts 
be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This spring, I have paid more attention to the beauty and the budding of the season, more so than any other time in my life. Some of you may know that I'm engaged and my fiance, Kelsey, uh, has a flower farm over in Roaring Spring. And a flower farm is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, she grows flowers that are harvested and sold to florists for their arrangements. And most of her growing takes place in the summer and in the early autumn, but this spring she broke into the world of commercial tulip growing. Now tulips are my favorite flower, and I say that because tulips are probably the one flower that I could actually identify and name. But last autumn, we planted 5,000 tulips, uh, tulips in dozens of varieties and all types of colors and all types of styles. And, and now for nearly a month, we have been pulling these flowers just as they begin to bud for harvest. And uh, there's a few dozen that are still left in the beds, but they've all either gone into the glory and they're blooming or they're past their prime and they're, they're wilting. And, uh, but this, this weekend, we picked the last of this tulip harvest. Thank God. I mean, it's, it's been pretty constant. And uh, it was a specialized variety that was harvested, something called ice cream tulips. And on the outside, it's purple, but on the inside, there is this raised, risen, white center to it. It looks like a scoop of ice cream. It looks like an ice cream cone. So over these past months, as I've seen all of this new life come out of the soil, the things that have gone into the ground last year, things that looked like they were dead. If you've ever seen a tulip bulb before, it's just nothing special. How can any life come out of this thing? Uh, but as these plants have sprouted and grown and bloomed during the course of this Easter season, spring's natural awakening has been this beautiful reminder of how all of God's world, all of creation, has a new creation and, and a resurrection. From seemingly dead and dormant life comes new life complete with all of these intricate flowers, complete with the incomplete songs of the, of the songbirds as they're learning their melodies, all of this life that we see from God our Creator. The new life that surrounds us in spring is an abundant sign of how God is making all things new. In this Easter season, this is the central promise that we live into, that God is making all things new, that death has been defeated and renewed with God's promises of resurrection and everlasting life. So today I read that passage from the book of Revelation. It is a passage that is one of my absolute favorites. It fascinates me and it, it overwhelms me with the promises that are lifted up. Now personally, I believe that Revelation offers some of the best words of comfort that we can find in all of the Bible but I also recognize that it has some of the most bizarre words. And today we hear of God's desire to dwell with us, to be with his people, to, to wipe every tear that is in our eyes. And John of Patmos, the, the writer of, of Revelation, he is giving us this extraordinary vision of what resurrected life will look like in the presence of God. But you know, it's, it's unfortunate. It's really unfortunate that the book of Revelation, because of all of the bizarre imagery and for other reasons, gets a bad rap. I believe that this book has received this reputation because it is, well, it's misunderstood, but it also has been exploited by Christian churches and by authors who promote a gospel of fear rather than a gospel of peace, promise, and hope. How many of you remember the Left Behind series? I mean, this, this series made waves uh, when it was released back in 1995. It 
the 16 books were written between 1995 and 2007, books that were loosely, loosely interpreted apocalyptic literature that is found in the Bible. And a central theme in the Left Behind series is this notion of rapture, that, quote, the true believers in Christ were raptured or taken up instantly into heaven only to leave the world shattered and chaotic. It's been 15 years since the last one of those books was published, and I think that now, in 2022, that some of those visions of rapture that we see in the books are probably just our normal day, a normal Tuesday in the year 2022. But, you know, rapture, it presents a lot of colorful imagery, a lot of scary imagery, and rapture has been used by doomsday prophets. Do you, any of you, remember Harold Camping? 11 years ago, a decade ago, Harold Camping predicted that Christ would return to earth on May 21st, 2011. And he said that at Christ's return, the religious, the righteous would fly up into heaven and then there would follow five months of fire and brimstone and plagues on the earth with millions of people dying each day and the world would ultimately be destroyed, be destroyed on October 21st, 2011. Well, people were enthralled by this. People even uh, who thought that they would be raptured took out insurance on their pets so that when they were raptured and their pets were left behind, that people who were atheists would come in and would care for their pets in their absence. It's amazing what people fell for, what people believed. And, he, and when that day came, and when it left without incident, he declared another day on which the world would come to an end, on which the people would be raptured up into heaven. And that day came, and that day went, and the world continues. This notion, this theology of rapture, it perplexes me. I have never been able to understand it, and I have I have read about it, I have studied it, I have read the scriptural passages that they tie together, even though they come from all these little places in the Bible, the few of them that exist. And, and I really have a hard time with a lot of it, but especially this us versus them violence that it tends to to foster. But what really perplexes me is that the doctrine of rapture is not, it's not just not found in the Bible. This whole idea has been built on a flimsy interpretation of a few, and I mean few, Bible verses that have taken out of context and then jammed together to create this doctrine. So contrary to popular apocalyptic thinking, there is no rapture. There is no future snatching of Christians from the earth that's found in the book of Revelation. Instead, in the book of Revelation, we see that God is raptured down to earth from heaven. God comes to earth to take up residence with us. I can say that Revelation is profoundly ecological because God desires to, to be here on earth, to renew all of creation, not just humanity, and that earth itself becomes the location for salvation, not heaven far away. The new Jerusalem comes down to earth from heaven. God renews creation with a new heaven and a new earth. And so it is in light of these promises, these promises that bring us comfort and hope, these promises of, of joy, of abiding in God's presence, that I would invite us to think about our ministry. In Christ, in the resurrection of the body, and in the new creation, God is making all things new. In Christ, everything will be transformed and we will all be like the springtime that is bursting with life all around us. And so I ask, in the midst of this action, in the midst of God making all things new, as, as we ourselves live into this Easter time of our resurrected lives, what pieces of our ministry do you want to make new? 
God is working through us. God is refreshing us. God is restoring us. God is rejuvenating us. And so with this new life in Christ, how can we, as the people of God, also work to renew the weary world that surrounds us? You know, I'm excited because this is where ministry happens. When our new lives in Christ connect with the needs of this world, extraordinary things happen. As God's agents, as, as God's ministers in this world, we have been empowered to make all things new. So ask yourselves, where can we make a difference? What part of this community and world needs the light of Christ, the light that we boldly bear? Where can we help to make all things new? You know, God in this, in this reading says, To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Who out there is thirsty and how can we carry that water to them? You know, tell me. Because I want to know. Talk to your friends and your neighbors and your family because this is a conversation that is worth having. We have skills. We have gifts. We have money and resources. And there's no reason that we cannot help to make things new for God's sake. So where will we start? God desires to be with God's people. So let us make it our mission to fulfill that desire to build these connections and to share in the promises of new life that God has given to us. Amen. And now set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray from... Let me start that again, I'm sorry. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, the world, and for all those who are in need. Loving God, lead us to follow your spirit rather than our own prejudices or desires as the church cares for one another. Open us to perceive your gifts to those we least expect and open us to the power of your Holy Spirit as we gather for our meeting today. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Inspire us to praise you through the beauty and majesty of the natural world around us. Urge us toward more deliberate care of the world that you have made. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Humble the rulers of nations before your splendor. Direct them to the to the people who need their attention most and turn them from temptation to hoard wealth and power. And Lord, help the rulers of this world find peace and promote peace, especially where there is war. We continue to pray for the people of Ukraine and for all other places where there is unrest. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Hasten to dwell among those who are in pain or distress. We pray for Tina, Doug, Kevin, Jim, Eileen, Scott, Colleen, Blake, Pat, and Donna. We pray for Lily, Mitch, Felicia, for Lorraine, Linda, Sandra, Donna, Bonnie, Shirley, and all those who we name out loud are in our hearts before you. As Christ enters our deepest suffering, remain with those experiencing despair and great need. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Place holy love at the center of all our relationships and communities. By your love, heal us, convict us, and renew us. We ask that you would bring an end to racism in our community and in our country. Let everyone know your goodness by the love you show for one another. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. And give us a place in the diverse company of your beloved saints. Teach us the value of each person's identity and bless us with a shared identity as your children. 
as the kindred of Christ. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Dwell in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.